All right. Well, good morning, HSM. We got some different vibes in worship today with some guest uh, performers. We got our drummer and Gertie playing the guitar. It's been great. It's been a good morning so far. Uh, if you were at <clears throat> the first uh, or main service today, there's going to be a little overlap. So it's never a bad thing. Um, but we are continuing our series in Psalms. And for those of you who for those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Gage. I am a student ministries resident, which just means I get the opportunity to, to see what life and ministry is like, and that's why I'm up here teaching today. Connor had some ministry reconnaissance to do, and so I get to step in when he has other things and other, other obligations. And like I said, we are continuing our series in Psalms, and before we get into uh, today's message, I want to preface by saying, uh, someone once said, what you believe about God is the most important thing about who you are. And why that's important is because as we have looked at these psalms and heard these psalms being preached and taught, we realize that behind every psalm is a person, a person that has gone through life difficulties, different circumstances, and surely doubts about God, which is no different from all of you in here, I'm sure. And our psalm today will be no different. David wrote this psalm. We're going to be looking at Psalm 139. We don't know when he wrote it, but I would like to think that it was somewhere middle to later of his life based on how he talks about God and what he has learned about God and how God has shown up in his life time after time after time. And a couple of things I want us to uh, think about and, and hear as we're going to read this psalm, the whole thing, uh, is, is David's very, very personal usage of I and my, Right? And so in the same way, I'm going to use the same kind of language of you and us so that we may walk away from uh, today having drawn nearer to our God just as David did in the midst of his trials and his suffering. And so with that being said, if you guys, like we always do, if you guys could get to your feet, we're going to read the whole Psalm, Psalm 139. So I'll get to there. And it says this. It says, O oh Lord, you have searched me and you have known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, and you discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down, and you are acquainted with all of my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O oh Lord, you know it altogether. And you hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit, or where shall I flee from your presence? Because if I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I take, <clears throat> sorry, if I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness has, shall cover me and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. For you formed my inward parts and you knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance, and in your book they were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God, and how vast is the sum of them. If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake, and I am still with you. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O oh God. O oh, men of blood, depart from me. They speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies, they take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O oh Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred, and I count them as my enemies. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any grievous way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Let's pray. Father, would we just see and know what David saw and knew about you, God? Would we come away today knowing how much and how well you know us, better than we know ourselves? God, would we know that even despite that, that you love us? God, would we be changed as a result of knowing your word and knowing who you are as our God, creator of the universe? So we pray, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. All right, we're going to jump right into this. There's a lot to unpack in this, uh, in this psalm. 
<clears throat> but the big idea I want you guys to walk away with, more than anything that you hear today, is that God knows you, he loves you, and he is with you. And that's going to be our first point today. God knows you completely, which means you cannot deceive him. Verse 1 through 6 says, You search me, O Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar, and you discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all of my ways, and before a word is on my tongue, Lord, you know it completely. David starts this psalm with praise and thanksgiving by acknowledging that God knows every single thing about who he is. I don't think I think about that enough, and I think most of us, if we're honest, would agree with that. That God knows everything about you. He knows when you wake up. He knows what you think about. He knows what you feel. And he even knows what you're going to say before you say it. He knows your struggles. He knows what makes you happy and your joys. He knows every part about who you are. And the verb search in that, in that text, it means to examine with pain and with care. It's like, uh, you know, those true crime shows Hopefully you don't watch those, but in the crime shows, uh, you know, they pour over all of this evidence and they're searching and searching, trying to make a determination on what is true and what is right. This is what the verb search means when David's talking about that, about God. Because you see, we, as human beings, we get to disclose what our friends know and see about us. We get to determine what others honestly really know about us. That's our choice. Our, see, our friends see the outside, but God searches, and he knows our hearts, and we cannot deceive him. If you know the Bible and you know Genesis, Adam and Eve tried this, right? God tells them, don't do this. They do it. God says, where are you guys? He, he knew where they physically were. He was wondering why they had left his presence. It's because they had sinned. They had doubted God, and God knew where they were. Later on in Genesis, Cain tried it. He asked Cain, where's your brother? He says, am I my brother's keeper? Cain tried to deceive God, despite God knowing <laughs> everything about him. And even David himself, in the Psalms, in the Bible, tried to deceive, right? You know the story of Bathsheba and Uriah. He, he commits murder and adultery and ultimately idolatry and tries to hide it, right, by getting Uriah killed. Eventually, all of them find out that God knows who they are, knows all about them, despite others maybe not knowing what they had done and what they had thought. And yet, God in his grace hems us in. In verse 5, the word hem, not a very common word, but in this, use, <clears throat> in this text, it really means when, when God is hems us in, we are so valuable to him that it, it's, it's as if he's using this word as, a, as, as guarding a valuable object. Because God's complete knowledge of us and his guidance for us are for our protection. I think a lot of times we get this idea that God is telling us all these things to do so that we, you know, we don't sin or um, we can't enjoy the things of this world. But that's, not, that's not God's heart for us. He's, he hems us in. He protects us as he guides us. Because in a world that often judges you and judges us based on outward appearance or the images that we present on our social medias, or our sports teams, or our friend groups. God sees beyond all of that, whether you believe it or not. So you, as followers of Jesus, don't have to put on a perfect face for God. You don't have to filter or edit your life before him. Because again, he already knows your thoughts, he knows your feelings, and he knows your struggles. He knows the real you. And he loves you completely anyway. This is something your friends are incapable of doing. Because if you're honest, if your best friend knew everything about the things that you said, did, or think, I think we have the tendency to think, they might not be my friend. And in some ways, that might be true. But this knowledge that God has of us, it should bring us, bring us great peace. It should bring peace to our hearts, because even if you don't feel it, it's still true. Sometimes, you know, you go through this life and you're like, man, I don't, I don't feel the peace of God. But feelings are not our determiner. They are valid and they are real, but they are not the ultimate source of truth. Hebrews 4.13 tells us, nothing in all of creation is hidden from God's sight. 
I admit to you as, a, as an early believer, as someone who was checking Christianity out, I was hearing things of like, God is all-knowing, he's sovereign, all of the all things, right? And that's intimidating. As someone who came to God later in life, all I could think about is all the things that I had done, the horrible things that I had said. How could this person, this God, love me despite all that? It doesn't make any sense. But it's actually a blessing. Because if we are fully seen and we are known by the creator and the sustainer of the universe, we can be, it's freeing. We can be honest with God. There's nothing that will scare him or intimidate him away from you. So we don't have to hide anything from him. Because it's also true that point two for today is that God is always with you. You cannot escape him. Verse 7 through 10 tells us, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on this far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. See, if God knows so much about us, maybe the wisest thing would be to run and to hide from him. But David tells us here that all of those types of efforts to try to escape God, they're futile. They're pointless. Because David realizes, and he's telling us, there's nowhere we can go that God isn't with him and with us. Whether he's on the, topest, on the top of the mountain, you know, he's been called to be king of Israel, or the darkest valley where he knows he's committed great sin, God was still right there, with, right there beside him. David says, if I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. This is a reminder that God's presence isn't limited to physical space, right? God is spirit. He is everywhere. And that means for you, he's with you wherever you are. Because God's heart, out of his character, he wants to walk with you. And he wants to guide you because his plan and his purposes for your life are what's very best. Again, whether you believe that or not, his ways and his desires for you are greater than anything you could imagine for yourself. And we have examples in scripture of those who wanted to flee from God's presence. In their situations, they always went from bad to worse. Again, with Adam and Eve, the result of that was they were cast from the garden away from God's presence, put under the curse of sin. We see it with the prophet Jonah, right? God tells him, I need, go to Nineveh. He's like, those people, that, um, I'm good. And God orchestrates him eventually going to Nineveh. The truth is, is that we need God's presence with us if, if we want to enjoy his love and fulfill his purposes in and through our lives. Again, we have those close friends that we would say, yeah, they're my, they're my ride or die. They're my bestie. They'll stick with me through thick and thin. You have this faith, this trust that they wouldn't leave you when the, when the going gets tough. And for some, that might be true, right? For me, I don't have any friends from high school or college. And I know that's not the norm for some of you or, or will be the norm for you. But I was called to a different life, a different path, and they stuck doing what we were always doing. And it hurts. I pray for them all the time. But like those friends that you would say, no, nah, they'd be with me through, through anything, God is even more constant than that because he can never leave you. Even if you feel like you're going through something alone, you're not. Because again, God is with us. And the reality is that some of you are going through really hard seasons right now in life. Some of you seniors, you're, you're freaking out. What am I going to do after high school? Some of you have family situations where you're like, I don't like being at home. My, my, my family life's a mess. Or even personal things where, you know, you're, you're, you're doubting or maybe you're just like, everything feels overwhelming. I know for some of your parents, they're freaking out about this week coming up. There's a lot of potentials for, for you guys in here to, to have the opportunity, to have anxiety, to have the fear. But again, this psalm, Psalm 139, it reminds us that even in those low points, God is with us. Even when you think that no one else could understand possibly what you're going through, God does. He is there. He's guiding. He's still holding you. Romans 8, 38 through 39 tells us, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth will be able to separate us from the love of God. 
Again, all of those things that I just mentioned, they can't separate you from God's loving presence. It's impossible. It would go against his promise, and that would make God a liar, which then would make him cease to be God. Brings us to point three. God knows you. He is with you. Point three, God made you with intention and purpose, and you cannot ignore him. Verses 13 through 14 say, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb, and I praise you because I'm fearfully and I'm wonderfully made. Again, if you're in main service, Kobe had talked about, you know, we sometimes have this overinflated view of self, like, uh, you know, God is, you know, God is with me, and God made me, and I'm his masterpiece, which those are true statements, but they can sometimes allow us to be these, you know, overconfident Christians, I would say. But this, this here, David's reflecting on how God created him with intention and with care. David realizes he's not an accident. He was made by God on purpose, for a purpose, and every part about who he is, his personality, his talents, his strengths, and even his quirks or the weird stuff about him, they were gifted to him by God. And God's desire, his will for you and for me is that we would accept that, that we would accept our genetics, our looks, our abilities or disabilities. I know that's kind of hard to accept, like... Is that, is that possible? Like, God doesn't make mistakes? Yes, it's possible. There's a purpose in everything that God has, has done. I do have to make the disclaimer that this doesn't mean that we can't desire to be healthy or work out or be strong or alter our physical appearance, you know, dyeing your hair or things like that. What, what he's talking about here is doing those things out of personal vanity, to, to maybe, you know, I, I want to work out so the, the girls will like me. I want to get big muscles because girls like big muscles. I, okay. Or ladies, right? Wear that piece of clothing or do that thing that maybe will gain the attention of such and such a person. Or avoid this friend group because if I hang out with them, then this friend group won't really like me or they'll think I'm weird. David's putting a kibosh to all that. Those things out of personal vanity are the height of pride. I know personally some of you in here are wildly talented in, in, various, in various areas, whether it's athletics or art or music. And some of you are, have made personal masterpieces already, right? Like you, you, would, you would be willing to share that with people. Every brush stroke, every musical note, every melody that you've created, it was with intention, I would, I would guess. Every color you choose is for a reason. This is the same with God. You are his masterpiece. The Bible tells us that. Every person made with intention and purpose. And just like I would argue, the artist doesn't really make mistakes in his art or their art. God didn't make a mistake when he made you. Some of you need to hear that today. You're not a mistake. Mm-mm. So I know it's super easy to feel insecure about yourself. The way the world is right now, you guys are on social media, you're inundated with do this or do that. You're not talented enough unless, or if you don't look the right way or you, know, you don't have what it takes to succeed, whatever that means, it's super easy to, to feel like you're not enough. But you don't have to be like anyone else. You don't have to try and be someone that you were not created to be. God made you exactly as you are for a reason. And if you don't know what that reason is, I'm glad you're here today. Because Ephesians, Ephesians 2.10 tells us that we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do the good works, which God prepared in, a, prepared in advance for us to do. So again, this means that God created you with unique giftings and abilities for a reason, there's a lot of talk of, you know, we're just trying to make it through this life. Sounds like life is a prison, right? We're stuck in these meat suits, just making it through till we die. But really what this life is, is an exciting pilgrimage because God has prepared us for what he prepared for us. If you haven't read or seen that movie, A Pilgrim's Progress, such an edifying 
a movie and book help make the really complex things of God pretty simple, honestly. But like David, our responsibility, our duty, is to yield and submit ourselves to those purposes that God has prepared for us daily. Because our fourth point is that God cares deeply, deeply about your life. Verse 17 and 18 says, How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. David here is amazed that the God of the universe would care so deeply about him and that his thoughts towards him would be countless. Again, have you, even, have you ever considered that? Have you ever heard that? That God's thoughts towards you are innumerable? More than you could ever imagine? They're infinite? This shows God's heart towards us as his children and his care for us and his love for us. For those of you who don't know, I got three kids and a wife and some of the more challenging times over this last year have been uh, when I've gone away on camps for you know a week and retreats for a few days. It's not like, oh, that's so hard, but as a, as a dad, um, and you guys will experience, it, experience this hopefully, my thoughts are always, man, when, when do I get to see my kids and my wife? Because my heart is towards them. My disposition towards them is that they're, they're like my, one of my purposes in this life. God has gifted them to me. And all I can think about sometimes is when do I get to see them again? When do I get to hug them and, and give them kisses? And when I do get home, it's as if they were thinking the same thing about me. When, does, when are we going to see daddy again? It's as if, like David, they know that I love them and have been thinking about them constantly. My oldest is three, and he can barely count to 20, so trying to explain this to him is completely pointless. He, d- he doesn't even fathom, you know, what infinite means. He can't. But that's not, that's, that's not for him to know. He needs to know that his daddy loves him and would do anything for him. And David realizes this, that God has unceasing thoughts and care towards us. So when you are feeling stressed or overwhelmed with school or, again, those things that I mentioned earlier, God cares about those things. He cares about every part. You're on his mind. He's paying attention to you. He's not this distant, far-off God. He's actively caring for you, and he's attentive to you every single day, even if you don't feel like that's the case. First Peter 5, 7 tells us, cast, your, cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. And this verse just reinforces and reminds us that we can bring everything to God, our worries, our struggles, and fears. We can bring them to God because he does care. So how, how does David respond to this understanding and this knowledge? How, how can we respond to, to knowing these things that are true of God and true of us? Well, Psalm 23, or verse 23 and verse 24 say, Search me, God, know my heart, and test me, and know my anxious thoughts, and see if there is any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. This comes right after he's asking God to slay all these wicked men and kill all these people and do all these things that honestly we shouldn't have desires of. But David knows as a result those things in his heart, they're keeping him from a full um, understanding of, of what God would have for him or full knowledge rather. Because David ends the psalm by inviting God to search his heart and show him anything that would need to change that would keep him from loving others and um, serving others well. David wants to live in a way that pleases God. So he asks God, the God who knows him better than he knows himself, for that knowledge to change him. Because if we trust in the knowledge we have about ourselves, bad things can happen, right? The heart is deceitful above all things. This is what gives David confidence to go to God and work in his heart and do the work that only God can do. We cannot change ourselves. We can do things that, you know, change our habits, which eventually change some results in our life. But the most important thing is that this changes, 
not our outward actions, this changes. And so the challenge for us is how do we grow in the confidence that David has in his God? How do we have the peace that David throughout his life shows through his Psalms of, you know, despite all these things happening, I still trust in God. All these bad things, quote unquote bad, I still trust in him. Well, some of you are already knowing what I'm about to say. The first thing is we have to know God's word. David knew God's word. If we don't know God's word, we don't know who God is and what he said he's like, we don't know his promises, we don't know how he um, loves and cares for us like David has shown us in this psalm, how are we to live strong in a world that is constantly trying to get at you, trying to pull you off track, distract you with the things of the world instead of the things that God, again, would hem us into and, and bring us into his purposes and plan. The next thing is, is we pray. I hope by now that as we've gone through these, this series on Psalms that you would understand and realize David was pouring his heart out all of the time. He was in constant communication with his God, talking with his God. Not only because he understood who God was, but he understood that God knew him again better than he knows himself. And if you want to change, I would ask the person that knows the most about you. And, that, and again, David shows us that. And thirdly, I would say the, the, the chain that brings those two things together is community. You can know all the scripture you want, or you can pray all you want but not know scripture. But without community, it's a little tough to make it through this life. Again, it's the height of, of Christian arrogance. It's the height of pride to think that you're somehow good enough to make it through this, this world and this life alone. Part of the Bible, it tells us that the enemy, the devil, he's like a lion. He's prowling around seeking someone to devour. And if you don't know how lions hunt, they try to find the one that has strayed from the pack, the one that's isolated, doing things by themselves, whether they know it or not. So this is why God, in his goodness and his kindness, has given us each other so that as we know scripture and we pray, we can bring these things to our community. And then as a result, we can be corrected, we can be encouraged, and even sometimes rebuked for some of the foolish things that we decide to do, despite knowing all of these things that may be true. And the good thing is, is David had people around him, they didn't care necessarily how he felt, right? The prophet Nathan comes to him and says, tells him the story about, you know, the man, the, the parable of the man, and, and uh, he says, that's you, man. You did that. And David, if, if David doesn't receive that correction and rebuke, we can only speculate, but it was in the goodness and the kindness of God that Nathan came to him and said, hey, man, we got to figure this out. So community is vital. I hope you hear that. I hope you believe that. That's why we do life groups here in HSM. It's so that when, when, not if the trials come, you have a community around you that can come alongside you and again, lift you up and endure those things with you. So again, if you want the peace, the confidence in God that David has, those three things are super vital to us. And the, here's the good news. This prayer that David is praying, this can be our prayer too. David's not some super Christian. He messed up, he sinned just like you and me. And we can ask God to show us the areas that we need to grow or we might need to change in in order that we may trust him more and follow him more closely. But here's the problem. These, all these things we've talked about, it's only available to those who have personally trusted in Jesus' sacrifice on their behalf, repented of their personal sin, their sin that has kept them from a right relationship with God. Because those who have not trusted or not believed in Jesus' death and resurrection, none of this is available to you. And that's bad news. 
Because what you're probably doing, if you haven't trusted in Jesus, you're, you're searching the world trying to find something to bring you peace, to bring you joy, to bring you whatever it is, you name it, attention, accolades. You're seeking those things that can never deliver. And so the challenge for you is, if that is you, if you want these things, they're made available to you through Jesus. That's it. It's simple. My hope is that as we've walked through 139, that you would know that you're fully known. And despite all the things that you may think would keep you from a relationship with God or his loving kindness towards you, he still loves you. He knows every detail about your life, so you don't have to try and hide from him or keep it from him. And that he also created you with purpose and nothing about you is an accident. Let this give you confidence and peace no matter what you face in the weeks and months ahead, even if you don't feel it. Let's pray. God, thank you for knowing us so fully and for loving us so perfectly. Thank you for being with us in every part of our life in the the smallest of details and for creating us with the purpose, a purpose that we could not come up with or make up on our own. And thank you for caring about each one of us in here. Caring about us so much that you sent your son Jesus to die so that we could have life. Help us to remember that as we go about our day, about our weeks, and lead us in the way that you would have us go. And help us to trust you with every part of our life. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, guys, that's it. You guys have a great rest of your day.